Okay, so let's do some R now. So let me just make this bigger. <clears throat> so T test and R are a simple function, T dot test. Woo! But um, the way that you write this is the same way we write the LM function where we're doing data screening. So you're going to do Y first, it is approximately, so it's that tilde thing. Sorry for you on your computer. I'm just going to copy and paste it from somewhere. <laughs> yeah. Uh, is approximated by x. So x is going to be a group variable, and uh, y or your dv is going to be your continuous variable. If you switch those, you'll know when you look at the output because it'll look crazy. Okay. Um, almost all of the functions work in that format. There's actually a different way to do t-tests as well, but I think if you learn this y is approximately x, that will apply to so many different functions that it'll help. You'll get the, it'll be a little easier later. Um, if you aren't sure what it is, always guess that format. Okay, it works 99% of the time. Okay. Then you would say data equals, you type the name of the data set. So you can use the dollar sign operators or the data equals. I like the data equals, it's a little faster. Okay. There's a um, piece of it that we're going to do, their var dot equal. So variance are, are equal. That's the homogeneity test. So we'll talk about what do I do if homogeneity is not met? You can turn that off. You can say false. The default is false. So um, you'll want to make sure you turn it on and make it true to get a traditional t-test. Um, otherwise, uh, you'll see the correction first. Okay. And then paired equals false because we're doing an independent t, so they're not paired. Okay, and that's the default as well. Uh, so you could accidentally run a in dependent t as independent. Okay. Um, so let's try it. So in my output here, I've got t.test. So I've got y, mischief, is approximated by cloak. And you'll see, like, t apply works the same way. It's y comma x, so y tilde x. Data equals, and I called it long data for reasons I can't remember, but I did. Okay. Variance dot equals was true, parity equals false. Okay, so it's got four arguments um, that you'll want to use. Now, parity equals false is the default. You could leave it off. But I think if you remember to put it in, you can remember which test you're running. So, okay, this one's independent, this one's dependent. So let's run that and look at the output, which I have on this side. Make it a little bigger. Okay. All right, so you'll see two sample t-tests. If you run the wrong one, you'll see Welch's two sample t-tests. Okay. So it gives me my t-value, 171. So that's the ratio of mean differences over standard error. Degrees of freedom is 22, so uh, 12 minus 1 plus 12 minus 1. And then it gives me my exact P. Okay, so this is P for this particular experiment. So the probability of this happening, given that ratio, is 10%. Okay. And since our rule is 5%, um, we would say that's non-significant. Okay. Um, it tells you here what the hypothesis would have been. So if you aren't sure when I ask you what's the question, you can look at the t-test output. So the true difference in means is not zero. So it's telling me the research here. Okay. You can actually set it to something else. You could set it to 15, but we're mostly going to work with doing it as zero. Okay. Gives you the 95% confidence interval of the mean difference. Okay. That's not the confidence interval for each group. That's the confidence interval of 1.25. Okay. So it gives me the mean difference score. Okay. Um, and that crosses zero. So it's not significant. And then it gives me my means again. What it doesn't give you is standard deviations. Annoying. So that's what we talked about t apply. So calculating the standard deviations yourself. What I've got down here in tiny type is how to write this in APA style. Okay. So here's a warning. If it's a letter, it's in italics. All statistical letters are in italics. Okay. So T, P, D, R, other ones F, chi square. It's a letter, it's in italics. Okay. And then, so we got T. This is degrees of freedom in parentheses. Um, if you're going to do AMA or Chicago, sometimes they're in like subscript, uh, but they're always next to the letter. This is the actual T value from your experiment, so 1.71, comma, P. And then it's usually listed as SIG or P value. So you put in the exact number. So 0.10, 1 okay. The rules for leading zeros on decimals is still confusing to me, but if the number can go over one, 
you put a zero on the front. If the number cannot go over one, you leave it off. That's really picky. I'm not going to check for that, but that is the rule. So P never has a zero in front of that decimal because it never goes over one. Okay. If you have a standard deviation of 0.83, it would have a zero. It could get over one. Okay. And so that's the technical zero rule. I did not know that until I had a copy editor write me a nasty email about it. With the page number from the manual, I was like, oh, person after my own heart. Fine. I'll fix it. <clears throat> so my funny story for the day is I wrote my one of my other classes an email about due dates last night. It was like, as it says in the syllabus, and on my grades, and on the schedule, and on this, and on this, it is due tonight. And then I could like copy them, <laughs> copied them all. It's like, stop emailing me stupid questions. So <clears throat> you guys have gotten it. Everyone's gotten a nasty email from me now. We're, we're done for the semester, hopefully. So <clears throat> my, I'm irritated at you email. <clears throat> so this would be a non-significant difference, getting back to the stats here. <clears throat> Um, but it might still be an important difference. So this is a real push partially from our lab, but also part of APA's task force, which is now, so, uh, I can drag, so 16. So it's from 1999 about having effect sizes with all of your tests. So effect sizes tell me how much I should care. Okay, so it's been a while since we've done this, right? It might not be statistically significant, but it might be practically very important. Uh, I have a paper right now, we're trying to figure out how to convince the reviewers that you can't just like randomly go to Uganda and collect more data. <laughs> this is the data we have, and the effect sizes are large, but it's not significant because we don't have a huge sample. Because you can't just randomly make people ill to test them. Right. <laughs> Nor can I just like hop to Uganda and make it happen. So um, more on emphasizing the effect size, how big this effect is versus how significant it is. Because significance only tells me if I had enough people to detect an effect at this one moment in time. Um, effect size tells me how much should I care. So yes, it's significant, but how important is that? So three different options. Four, we're not going to use R. R is not super popular for two, um, two group tests. Okay. We're going to use D. So. Show you how this works. So we just finished talking about how T is mean difference divided by standard error. It, so that's how you get the ratio of good variance to bad variance, and it tells me um, did this cross the magic finish line. <laughs> D, the most popular effect size, is Cohen's D, um, is a very similar test. So it's mean minus mean. It's not a test. Sorry, number divided by standard deviation. So we're just going back to the estimates from the sample. Okay, instead of our approximation for the population, we're going back a step to standard deviation. Okay. Um, so that means that T will always be larger than D, unless they're both zero, because this standard error is always a smaller number than standard deviation. So have I done this right? Is it a smaller number? absolute value, then well, I'm likely right. Um, so this has been the one that's been around for a long time. You'll see it in a lot of research papers. It's usually just listed as D, lowercase d. Sometimes people will use G instead. Okay. So Hedges G is a correction on D. Okay. And so the argument is that D is overestimating the population effect size <clears throat> by a smidge. So what Hedges does is it takes that effect size and multiplies it by a correction. Both very easy to use, um, both popular. I say D is a little more popular, um, but you can use either one. Just tell me which one you're using by using D or G. Uh, delta, however, is a little different. And I won't make you learn what the correction is. It's a lot of symbols. <laughs> Delta, mean minus mean over control group standard deviation. <clears throat> so we're still using that idea of good variance to bad variance. Uh, so we're still doing mean minus mean, but it's control group standard deviation. 
And that is for very traditional experiments that have control groups and experimental manipulations. It doesn't really work for men and women because who's the control group in there? Okay. Or any kind of low-high distinction. Uh, so it's not popular because most people are not doing this kind of thing where a control group is um, truly the absence of the manipulation. So if you had, like, let's say, a dosage study, so you had a placebo of pills and then 10 milligrams, that would be a good uh, glasses delta because the placebo would be a true control. Okay. We won't really use it uh, because we don't tend to have experiment examples that are like truly a control group. Okay. And then R is a correlation. Okay. Um, but I don't know that correlations make a whole lot of sense to me when we're talking about two groups. Okay. But you could also use R. So which one should I use? I would go with D or G. <clears throat> so, our lab has created a free effect size calculator. There are effect size packages, but the problem is they're, they're not limited. Most people just do the math themselves, but like I don't like to math. So we've made a program that maths for us, and it's pretty. Mm -hmm, pretty. Um, we're also working on putting it all online on our new website. And by we, I mean I'm like, come on, Tim, who's our programmer, finish. You make me crazy. So at some point, we'll also be online. So right now, you can just download the calculator. I, put, I did put that on Blackboard under lecture notes, uh, right above uh, chapter 9, because this is where we're going to start using it. It's a Java-based program, so it will run on any computer that has Java. So not iPads, but services, it will run. <clears throat> See, open the little program. So you should get this pretty screen. Ooh, ah. okay. um, if you have any troubles with it, let me know. It does act funny sometimes. <laughs> so if you click on measures, you'll see a whole bunch of different statistics. And what the note on Blackboard says is that these work just fine, but the confidence interval isn't quite right on them. We're not going to use the confidence interval, so this will work great for class. Um, but one of the reasons why we're putting everything online now is uh, that math is hard, and we can't get it to work quite right, but if we put it online, we can use Python, which will do the math for us. And my programmer dude was just like, Python me, please. I was like, sure, I don't, whatever. So <clears throat> if you want to program incomplete beta, great. I don't, so. <clears throat> All right, so what we're going to do is go down to independent T. So it's listed by a test type, which makes it a lot easier, so independent T. And then, what do I have to type in? Okay. And the video covers this as well. So I'm going to go back to R here. I've got my means, but I also need my standard deviations and N. So the reason I ran T apply for M, N, and SD was to be able to do this step. And report, because I need means and standard deviations to report it anyway. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to type. You do not have to double click and erase the zero. It will overwrite. So if it's highlighted in blue, um, it will automatically overwrite whatever's in that cell. Okay. So don't feel like you need to backspace it out first. So I'm going to put in my means first. I got 5, 3.75. Okay. Group 1 standard deviation, just do it in the same order. So 1.65, 1.91. So you'll notice the picture is changing. Okay. Leave standard error alone. If you don't want to go through all the rigmarole and R to calculate standard error, look, it's right there. Okay, it auto calculates. However, at the moment, it's wrong. Why is it wrong? Because you have to enter in. So 12 and 12. Okay. So the program already comes loaded with some numbers in specific places, so we're not dividing by zero. That's one problem we had, where it would just like freak out because it would try to leave zero people in there, so you knew how to fill it in, and it just went, ah, I can't handle this. So, me, um, let me go to a different one. The um, size always has two in it, so that you get some degrees of freedom greater than zero. So you always have to make sure you enter at least M, some form of standard deviation or standard error, and N. Okay. So I got, let me retype this real quick. Uh, I'm at 1.65, 1.91. 12 and 12. So those are the standard errors for our group. I don't think I can make this any larger. Sorry. 
you will notice that the T statistic matches. So did I do this correctly? Well, here's T, 1.71. Here's what Mo gave me, 1.71. So I'm doing pretty good. Uh, can I use this program to do the entire thing? No, sorry, it doesn't give you P. Working on it. I was like, why can't we have P? He's like, oh, we can do that. And I'm like, it's just okay. <laughs> and that's what will be online. We're adding that. Uh, it gives me a whole bunch of numbers that it calculated. So it calculated our pooled standard deviation. So that's the denominator here. Numerator, denominator, yeah, bottom. Okay. Pooled standard error is the one for T. Okay. And then it gives me Cohen's D right here. Okay. So the effect size for this particular one is 0.7. Okay. Uh, somewhere between medium and large. It's a little closer to large. So I would say that this is probably a difference that's important, but it's not significant. So why isn't it significant? Because we only have 12 people in each group. Right? That's not quite enough. Right? That doesn't even meet the magic number of 30. <clears throat> so that's the easy way to get D. So you're just looking where it says Cohen's D. Ignore lower and upper. That's the confidence interval for D. And the purpose of that is more for research. So this program is really meant to be both teaching and research. <clears throat> All right. So, ta-da. So in reporting this, you just stick D next to P. Okay. So the most common way to report effect sizes is just to put them right next to P or have them in their own sentence, but it's usually after you say if the test is significant or not. Okay. <coughs> Oop, too much. Okay. Now, we didn't get a significant effect, so let's talk about G power. So how do I calculate how many people did I actually need to get this effect? Normally you do power at the beginning. Right. And you have an estimate of your effect size, and you would do it before the experiment. But this happens a lot where you get to the end of the experiment, and you're like, oh, this is a large effect size. Why didn't I find a significant effect? Well, how many people do you actually need to find that effect? Right. So G power should still be on all of your computers, because you used it on the tests. Hopefully you haven't deleted it out of rage right, for G power. Is it not on my computer still? Haterade. All right. So G power should still be on all your computers, except mine, because you know the computer guys don't like me. Fortunately, they don't watch these things, so I can talk bad. So next semester, when you have Mitchell and he makes you use the power tables, you can be like, but I know how to use G-Power. And one day we'll convince him that power tables are old folks. Right. I was just talking to the computer guy, too. I should have complained. Go. All right. Here we go. So what do you want to do? I've got T-Test as my family. We're not doing correlations. So under statistical test, you're going to go down to independent means, two groups. So it's an independent t-test, so independent means. Okay. You can also pick from up here tests. I don't know that I like this quite as much, but it gives you a little bit more two independent groups. So a descriptive in a different way. So if you can't figure it out, try the test window. Okay, we'll pull up the same one. Okay. Uh, so means, two groups. Be sure you change your tails. That's what some of you missed on different things. So tails, it should be two. Okay. I'm going to fill in my effect size. So if you aren't confident in moat, remember you can use determine to come up with the effect size. It works the exact same math. So since I've already done that, I'm going to do 0 0.70 here. Alpha is 0 0.05, but power is 0 0.8. That was the other thing. So if you got 0.75 on your... Um, G power question, it's probably because you didn't change power to 0 0.8. <clears throat> and my allocation ratio, I got 12 to 12. So we're at one equal groups right now. So hit calculate, or if you're on a Mac, just hit enter when you're in one of the windows. So I need 68 people. So I'm way under power. I got 24. I need 68. And that's why we can't find a difference that is probably pretty big. All right, and then I wrote out what everything I typed in here. So you can have it for working on your homework. 
questions on this bad boy? Everybody get 68, hopefully? <laughs> you should all get the same number? Yes. Always take a screenshot. I can give you partial credit if I have a screenshot and I can tell, oh, look, you just filled in the wrong power numbers. But if you have no screenshot, it's kind of hard to tell where the hell you got that number from. <coughs> so, screenshot. Just like this window. So you can type it in or you can look at the picture. Woohoo! Yeah. So, how do I report this independent t test? So, here's just an example because you have to do this on the homework. So, participants had an invisibility cloak, were more mischievous than those who did not have the cloak, so I got means of standard deviations. You can also do standard error, pick one and stick with it. I find standard deviation a little easier. Um, this difference was not significant, but it is a medium effect. So, everything should be two decimals. Two. Two, very important. Two. APA actually says three, but nobody does that, literally. I, I reported three decimals for a uh, scale development we were doing, and they were like, APA says two. And so I was like, hmm, manual page, whatever it was, 35 says three. However, to make you happy, we changed them all to two. Um, and so that's why some of the reviewer wrote, or the uh, copy editor wrote me back about the leading zeros, and they told me what page it was on. I was like, okay, I've done that before, so I kind of have to be, okay, fine. <laughs> so two decimals, because that's sort of standard. Okay. And so in theory, actually, this bad boy should have a zero on the front, because okay, D does get over one. <clears throat> Can't follow my own rules. So how do I get this correct in my homework? You've got means, standard deviations, T, P, D, so the rhyming group. Um, and you tell me, is it significant? Is it not significant? What happened? So uh, the cloak people did more than the non-cloak people, but not significant. Okay. <clears throat> okay. Questions on an independent T. Nope. Let's switch to dependent T. And we're going to use the exact same data set to show you how power matters based on the type of test, because we haven't really talked about that yet. So now, we're going to ask if people are mischievous, but we're going to give everybody a cloak and then also film them with no cloak. So we're big brothering this. Right. So we're, people as normal, and then the second week we're giving them an invisibility cloak. So we've got week one and week two. So now this is a dependent test. All 24 people get both uh, manipulations. Uh, and so we're measuring how many mischievous acts they have based on cloak and no cloak. So the logic behind dependent T is the same as independent T. Um, but we have to control for the fact that people are in it twice. So um, <coughs> independent T is like this is group one and group two. Right? And this is weighted standard error. <coughs> based on group one, group two. Dependent T okay, is still mean minus mean. But now this is time one, or measurement one, or thing number one, and time two. Okay. So these are the same people. So my score is getting subtracted from my score, not group one minus group two. Okay. So most people talk about this as mean differences. So the mean difference for each participant, how much do they change from time one to time two? So if I took uh, the subtraction of your take home for time one and your take home for the second exam, I'm subtracting you against you and not you know, uh, group one exam and group two exam. <clears throat> so this controls for the fact that people are the same. <clears throat> Other thing we're gonna do, still standard error, but it's of the differences. <clears throat> All right, so the problem is they're both standard errors of the differences, but I think that confuses people. Uh, for independent T, it's a weighted standard error. So it's standard error for group one, standard error for group two, and it's weighted based on how many people are in each group. Okay. With dependent T, there's one group. So uh, what we do is we take those mean differences and calculate the standard error for that. So I've subtracted, I've got time one and time two, and I've just created myself a column that's, here's all the different scores. So here's how much people changed across time. 
And so I take the average of their change and the standard error of their change. Does that make sense to people? Yes. So we go from having two scores from each person to one change score, and we calculate T based on their change score. <coughs> but it's the same logic. The change should be greater than zero. So it's still mean minus mean. The null is true. It's zero. So again, don't overthink that question on your homework. The answer is zero and not zero. Okay. And then it's standard error of the differences. So be sure you have of differences to denote it from a weighted standard error. So it's a like standard error of the different scores. And in the example video, I talk about how can I get that value, and I'll show you how to calculate it. Right. So here's the formula for it. Uh, so what is the giant D up there? That's mean difference score. Okay, so it's mean minus mean for each person. So how different is person one from person one? Minus the population, so zero. So it's essentially this, mean minus mean minus zero. That's what this says. So I would expect the mean difference for each person to be zero if the null was true. So often this little number gets just dropped. Because it's still minus zero. Divided by standard deviation, divided by the square root of n, which is standard error, but it's standard error of the differences. Okay. So it's basically this. <coughs> okay. I don't want to do that, though. That's math. So it's the same code. But what we're going to change is paired equals true now, instead of paired equals false. <coughs> so we go back to R here. Now, quick warning. Do, do, do. So I'm on line 15 ish. I know I added some lines. Um, paired equals, no, that's paired equals false. I'm on 20 ish. <coughs> this does have to be in long format. So most of the data you will upload will be in wide format. So if your data set is in wide format, you need to melt it into long format. You can actually run the t-test in wide format, but that gets very confusing. So we're going to do everything in long format, so the code is always the same. So that's why I said you just have to know which one it is. Is it dependent or is it independent? Uh, now, var.equal does not do anything in a dependent test. It basically ignores it. But I think it's, it's important to have for the independent t one, so just keep typing it. Because then if you leave it in and you leave it as true, me. Um, you can't forget it. View that always has to be there. Um, it doesn't do anything on a dependent test. Okay. So before I run that, let me show you what it does for an independent test because I forgot to go over that. Okay. So I'm actually going to go back up to 15. So this is the one we ran first. So this is the the uh, independent t test, right? If I make var dot equal false, what's that going to do? That corrects for problems with homogeneity. Okay, so if you have homogeneity issues, you can fix it right here simply by making it false. And the output you'll get will look very similar. So it says Welsh two sample t test. Copy this. It'll work. It is a Welsh Satterwaith correction, which is just fun to say, not to spell. <coughs> And then I ran this one. Here's comparison. Okay, so what is it doing to correct for homogeneity? Well, T is the same. So here's T for the Welch, and here's T for the traditional T test. Okay? So it calculates T the exact same way. It's mean minus mean over standard error. Um, it ca the means are still the same out here. The uh, estimates of the confidence interval are still the same. Here's what's different, the degrees of freedom. And so it kind of freaks people out sometimes, and they think that you don't know what you're doing because you've used partial degrees of freedom. When we get to repeated measures, we'll talk about that a lot more. Or um, repeated measures ANOVA, we have multiple groups. And so what it does is it, it corrects your degrees of freedom by how different the variances are, okay. um, which is nice. Because if they're very, very different, uh, it, it fixes it for you. If they're not so different, then um, it gives you a smaller correction. So it's 21.5 versus 22 because the, the standard deviations were pretty close. So 1.6, 1.9. And then based on those weird estimated degrees of freedom, it changes P. Okay. So this is what changes out here. 
and our homogeneity was pretty close because it's not very different. Okay? If these two things are very, very different, it will change them a lot. Okay? So that is what the correction does. It corrects the degrees of freedom based on the differences in variances, which then changes P. <clears throat> so it's a correction on DF uh, and not the T value itself. <clears throat> Sorry, I forgot to go over that a minute ago. All right. So on your homework, on the lab it says do everything with variance as equal just to get practice. On the homework it says do whatever the data screening implies you should do. Okay. So uh, getting back to, I think you had asked it originally, what if? Now we're getting into how do I apply that to each test. Okay, okay but back to dependency. Here we go. So now we've changed paired to true. Um, and variance not equal doesn't do anything, but I'm going to leave it in. I'm going to run that. So I have that printed out for us. This is the exact same data. So the first test was not significant with independent T, and it said we needed 68 people. So we're underpowered. The exact same data. Same mean, same standard deviations is now significant. Uh, so we're going to go three decimals for p-values. Okay. Uh, let me remind you of something. We've only done this once. One problem is that it will do scientific notation if p gets very small. And I think it's confusing to people because it looks like the p-value is 2.8. P-values do not go over 1. So you can remember to turn off um, scientific notation with this option, psi pen equals 999. Okay. And that will turn off scientific notation. What happens to me is I run it and I'm like, oh, stupid scientific notation. Ah. So this is the code. <coughs> All right, let me get back here. <coughs> So what's happening? Well, I got my t value. So this is a ratio of the mean differences over the standard error of the differences. Um, so the standard error of the difference score always tends to be smaller than a weighted standard error. Okay. Degrees of freedom is only 11. Why is it only 11? Okay. Um, I have 12 people. I, I think it's a 24 on this slide. That's a typo. Lies. There are 12 people. My bad. So back up on the slides. There are only 12 people in our data set. But they're tested twice. So I have 24 data points, but only 12 people. And it's n minus 1, not data points minus 1. So I have one sample of 12 people. Now they're tested twice, so I've got 24 lines. But you have to remember that's only still 12 people. The degrees, the degrees of freedom is actually less. Less degrees of freedom usually means less power. But because the standard deviation of the differences is always small, unless you've got really crazy um, different scores, that helps power. So you lose power because you get less people, but it helps power because this is always usually a small number. Okay. So my p-value on this one is significant. And that is what I mean by type of test. So we talked about power is affected by effect size. That's pretty easy. Bigger effect size is more power. Sample size, more people, more power. Um, and then I said alpha, but we're not going to change that, 0.05. And then I said type of test. We'll come back to it later. Here we are. So repeated measures, designs, or dependent tests always have more power okay? because the denominator is almost always smaller. Okay? And mathematically, that works out to bigger t values. Uh, so that has finally closed that gap. Um, <clears throat> this gives you the mean difference. So it takes time 1 minus time 2 and gives you that score. And then here's the confidence interval of the, that difference. So really, the output for these two tests are very similar. So you just have to know. Is it paired or not paired? And it says up here that you did paired. Okay. If you turn variance equal equals false, you'll get the exact same output. Okay. Um, and that's because homogeneity doesn't quite apply to a dependent test. Okay. Not in the same way. Okay. <clears throat> and we talked very briefly about sporicity when we did assumptions. Sporicity is what applies more to repeated measures. But when you only have two time points, sporicity isn't a thing. 
And when we get to repeated measures, we'll talk about why some more. But for right now, if you have two time points, no sporicity. <clears throat> so let me see where else I'm at. So let's do the effect size for this one now. You have two options. Again, two. Oops, that's G-Power. There we go. Um, Cohen's D based on two different numbers. So I've got D averages and D diff. And so what are those two things? So I'm going to make you a chart. Because I love charts. T with D. Okay. Oh. Independent T, dependent T. Okay. So that mean minus mean over standard error, our weighted standard error. Okay. Here I got mean minus mean over standard error differences. For independent T, Cohen's D is mean minus mean over standard deviation weighted. It's called pooled, but weighted is a better term for what it's doing. Okay. Now, for dependent T, the most popular type is D differences. So I do mean minus mean over standard deviation of the differences. Okay. So on this one, what we've got is from standard error to standard deviation. So we're just taking a step back. We're taking in out of the equation. Because remember, <clears throat> standard error. Standard deviation divided by square root of n. So going from t to d is taking out n. Okay, we're removing it mathematically. Okay. Because in theory, effect size is not based on sample size. In practice, it can be. But in theory, it's not. So we're taking n out of the equation. d differences, so this is diff here, is doing just that, taking n out of the equation. So I like ddiff because it matches the test statistic. So it matches this pattern where I'm just taking out the number of people in the test. However, the argument is, so there's nothing here, that d differences overestimates the population uh, effect size. Okay, and some people, some really smart people have done studies that kind of show that that's tr a thing. Um, my favorite thing is this book is called The New Statistics, which just sounds like, woo, fancy. It should be called effect sizes, all of them, on crack. Uh, I've talked to the guy who written it. It's really, it's really fun, because uh, a lot of these big publications going on right now are about the new statistics, this sort of idea, okay, effect sizes. Right. So still mean minus mean, but now it's average standard deviation of time one and time two. Okay. <clears throat> And so it's not really a weighted average because there are the same number of people in each condition, uh, level, sorry, level because they're tested twice. So you just take time one standard deviation, time two is average them together. So that means this, usually. So D diff is almost always larger than D averages because generally the standard deviation, the difference scores is a smaller number than averaging the standard deviations. That's not always true, but generally is true. <clears throat> so which one do I use? I tend to use D diff because I prefer it to be based on the test statistic because everything else is. A lot of people are doing, you should do D averages because it's a more realistic estimate of the population. I don't care, pick one. But when you pick one, tell me which one you're using. Okay. So you can abbreviate it as D diff. So the big problem that um, we're having right now, we, the global we, is that people don't tell you which mathematically they're using. Okay. Uh, so always using uh, some sort of subscript that tells me which, co which D formula you're using. Okay. And so that's really the big push is like tell people which one you're using. Use it and tell people which one. Okay. <clears throat> All right. So since Moat was actually inspired by the new statistics book, um, you have both of them in here. So we have dependent T averages or dependent T differences. Okay. So let's do averages first. All right, where I'm at. So I have my means and standard deviations still because it's the same test. Oops. 
So D differences, or I'm sorry, D averages looks just like independent to E because it's basically the same math. So I'm going to do 5, 3.75, oops. I'm going to try to type decimals in the right place. There we go. It automatically calculates mean difference for me. Okay. So, or you could just enter the mean difference. So you could type 1.25 from the um, t-test. Standard deviation, 1.65, 1.91. And then how many people? There's 12. Right? Now, t will not match. So do not look at it to match because it's a very different formula. Okay? So t will not be the same. Ignore. But it says Cohen's d is 0.70. Okay? And the reason they're the same is because we use the same um, uh, brain fart, the same data. So they won't always match independent t. It's just because we're doing this as an example. So you're at 0.70. Okay. If instead I want to do the other one, you go measures and then SD diff. Okay. Now, we don't really have standard deviation of the difference or standard error of the differences very easily. Um, it's not too hard to calculate, but I'm like on the side of you guys, like go simplest route possible. Um, and because this is mathematically just a transform of this, you can enter t directly. So I'm going to enter my t value this time. So what did I say? 380? Yeah. So 3.80. And then n. So t and n. So 12. And that'll give me 1.10. So what do I got to enter? Just keep going with this chart. Don't make it crazy. Right? I can draw the lines in the right place here. So you got to enter M, S, D, because you got it, and N for each group. Okay. On differences, you can enter T and N. On averages, M, S, D, and N. Do not enter T on this one. You can do it, it will be fairly close. But it does tend to over, uh, was it over or under? It tends to bias D, so it's not quite correct. If you have means of standard deviations, use those. Okay. Uh, for reasons that are math. Okay. All right, so this makes sense. So these are the minimum number of things you have to enter. N is the important one. People leave it out because it starts to calculate for you. You can get excited. There's numbers and we move on. But if you leave N as 2, which is the default, in the program so it doesn't divide by zero, uh, you will have the wrong number. So make sure you enter in. <clears throat> which one should you use? Don't care. Pick your favorite. Um, but be sure you tell us which one it is. <clears throat> All right. Ta-da. And I have the big note. T will not match. Not on D averages. It will match on D difference because you're using it to type it in. <clears throat> All right, so reporting that one, look, it looks almost exactly the same. So people given a cloak, um, engaged in more access, uh, more mischief than when they didn't have the cloak. Right. So that difference was significant and is a medium effect, so I did the average. Okay. Yeah? And that should have bleeding zero as well. Yes. So, and really, honest, like, this is cut and pasted clearly. So the then when this should be then when, right? Because it's the same people. So participants when they have the cloak are more mischievous than when they don't have the cloak. Okay. So that makes it clear it's a paired test. Okay. But it still has mean, standard deviations, T, P, and D. What happened? The difference was significant. And that's how we score these when you're doing the write-up. Does it have means? Does it have standard deviations? Does it have the test statistic? Can, is it in English? So grammar. <clears throat> All right, but how many people would I have needed? So ending with G power for dependent T. Okay. <clears throat> and there's my note to remind myself to talk about type of test for power, but we've already gotten over that. So on G power, we're going to pick on T tests differences between two dependent means or matched pairs. And when you see that, the little n thing goes away. Because since they're matched, everybody has both scores, so there's no n ratio. It's a two-tailed test. 
Uh, what effect size? We had 0 0.70, right? And then under power, I got 0 0.8. So I need 19 people. I had 12, but it was still significant. Okay, so I would have thought I would have needed 19, but 12 was good enough. If I calculate with the larger effect size, 1.10, I would have gotten nine people. So which effect size should you use? I'd tell you to use the smaller one because then you'll shoot for too many participants and too many participants is never a problem. Too few is the problem. Okay, so go with the smaller one. Right. So it should be pretty close here. Da -da -da. Right. And then back to everybody's favorite Plot. Right. These are the exact same graph, graphs we've been doing. Okay. Um, so, simple bar graph, <coughs> uh, which I have programmed in for you guys already. Right. <coughs> so, I've got my theme coding that we've been using. No pal, oh, darn it. Stupid computers that reset. So this graph should be um, very familiar. If you're struggling with graphs, come get help. Uh, mostly the problem people are having is the x and y axis labels are not descriptive enough. So yes, this would be mischievousness on the y axis, but what about it? It's average mischievous x. So tell me what the number represents. Okay. So usually giving it a more descriptive label, more words than less words. So I'm not going to go through all this schmat on ggplots. I do want to show you one new thing okay, um, that I don't have on here yet. <clears throat> okay, but let's object. What? Why are you going to hate? Come on. Oh. So you know that thing about loading the library. It helps if you do that first. I don't know how to. Uh, why? We okay. did that. Why? why do you hate me? Oh. <laughs> uh, okay, well, hopefully, all of you are using your own computers, so this is not an issue. Let's try one more time. Oh, it did make me a graph. I just couldn't do the error bars. This time it should work. There we go. Okay, so. Something we have not covered, so we're going to add this now. How do I change the limits on the y-axis so I don't lie with the graph? It's actually not too bad. So we're talking about how do I change the y-axis limit? So let's say the average number of mischievous acts, let's say it actually went up to 10. And so I want to make this graph 0 to 10, and so I'm not highlighting, like, like it, it, they, I'm not squishing or stretching the y-axis. And so the way you do that is scale y continuous, because it is continuous this time. Okay. So very similar to scale x discrete, scale x manual. So the ones we've been using to change legend labels and stuff. We're changing the y-axis, though. So it's scale y, and y is continuous in these bar graphs. So scale y continuous. Okay. And then it's very easy. It's limits. Thank goodness, right? And then lower comma upper. So I'm going to go 0 comma 6. Oh, no, 10. I just said 10. Okay. <clears throat> so scale y continuous limits equals lower comma upper. And remember, we got to concatenate them together. So let's see them together. <clears throat> and that will change the y-axis length. Okay. So now I've squished it down. Adding just one little new tweak, so I can control how y or how tall the y-axis is. And that's really important for scales that have a predetermined limit. So if you're working on a, let's say, a Likert scale, and it's one to seven, um, ours always going to do the default as zero as the lower limit. So I could change this from one to seven, and that will not include zero. So I'm not including a number that can't possibly happen on my scale. Okay. So scale y continuous. And now I can lop off um, zero, which it didn't like too much, because zero is a number in my data set. Okay. Um, so it didn't like that because I have people who have zeros. Okay. But if your scale is one to seven, it won't be there. 
So something a little new. And then I talk about that in the video as well. And then you have this one. <laughs> All right. Uh, so looking at my y-axis here, so average mischievous x. So it's not just mischief. Um, and so I, on the y especially, like what is it they're actually doing? I'm actually counting their x. So if you just said mischief, I'd be like, well, how are we scoring that? Is it like, are we counting or are they rating? So um, on the test, confidence rating or average rating score, something like that. Okay, how many slides is this? It's like, oh, three. We can totally get through this. So for the data screening part, okay. and this is just like a quick review. So t-test assumptions. So um, homogeneity variance is a big one. And that's where I can deal with var dot equal. I can make it true and false. So homogeneity becomes important for independent t, not dependent t. Okay. Um, so people in each group have the same variances. Okay. Um, and so what I tell you to do is to look at that residual scatter plot and see, you know, does it match what I would expect? But you can also calculate the standard deviations for each group. If the standard deviations for each group are roughly the same, then you've met homogeneity. We're going to talk about Levine's test when we get to ANOVA. Uh, but homogeneity is really important for independent t, and that's what var dot equal, you can take it true or false. So you could do it either way. So if you have a problem with it, that's where you fix it. Okay. If you got linearity or some of these other problems, you got to do a non-parametric test. Okay. So you still have to fix accuracy, missing, and outliers. Okay, that's always true of every test. Independence, you just have to know that their scores are independent. Okay. Normal, linear, homogeneity, or homoscedasticity. There's no multicollinearity for either test. Why no multicollinearity? There is one dv, one dv for group one and group two, or one dv measured twice. It's still one dv, so you can't correlate it with anything. Right? This hand motion, ah, which no one can see. Um, <clears throat> so since there's only one dv, there's no multicollinearity. Okay? Um, because in a repeated measures design or a dependent t, you want them to be super correlated. That means that people are still the same people, and that gives you more power. So we don't care if time one and time two are correlated. Okay. So no multicollinearity. Okay. If you have this in long format, it would be kind of hard to do multicollinearity because there would only be one continuous column. Okay. So when I ask you why you aren't doing this, this is the answer, 1 dB. Okay. Um, and so we've covered this, but just so you have it on a slide. So when homogeneity is messed up, you can do, do that by changing the var dot equal. It will do a Welsh or sadder ways. Cut and pasted it from the R documentation, because I can't spell it. Um, approximation for degrees of freedom. So it's editing degrees of freedom, and that then changes P. Okay, so it doesn't change anything on the T side. It's all on the degrees of freedom side. Okay. And so that's how I could fix this problem. If you have problems with linearity, you got to do a non-parametric test. If you have problems with normality, you need more people. Okay. Uh, I think that's all of them. Yes. All right, and so here are some examples for non-parametric tests. Okay. So when you don't have a linearity or normality solution. So Man Whitney U, the Wilcoxon rank sum test, which is different than the Wilcoxon signed rank test. So they're different for independent, dependent, or you could bootstrap. Okay. We won't have time to cover all of those, but if you're in that situation, I can help you run those. But not too bad in R. Okay. Um, I think the code is like Wilcox and then the exact same type of t-test code. And then that is the slides, woohoo! I made it all the way through all the lecture slides on lecture day. Look at me go. 